So in this talk, I'll focus on the second approach to study monopole operators and the Coulomb branch using one-dimensional quantum mechanics with the interface. Monopoles in 3D gauge theory is a very interesting, non-perturbative object. Their vacuum expectation value gives additional uh, direction in the vacuum moduli space, and also often they provide additional conserved current in the infrared fixed point. So the IR fixed point theory uh, often experience non-trivial symmetry enhancement. The famous example is the ABGM theory, where we have the non-trivial supersymmetry enhancement by the monopole operators. But these operators involve very complicated quantum dynamics and strong coupling dynamics of the 3D gauge theory. So in general, it's not easy to analyze uh, this uh, monopole operators directly using some perturbative analysis. So it, it means uh, it's very hard to study the Coulomb branch, which is generated by the monopole operators. In this talk, I will introduce an interesting new approach for the monopole operators and the Coulomb branch. Basically, we will focus on the monopole action on the vortex stage. So we know that vortex is a kind of the operator which create and annihilate the, oh, sorry, monopole is operator which create and annihilate the vortex stage. So by reading up their actions, the monopole actions on the vortex stage, we can extract many important quantum properties of the monopole, uh, monopole operators. So in this, sorry? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. We'll study monopole operator in the Higgs branch and extract the Coulomb branch joint. Okay, yeah, that is our thing. Yeah. So we'll basically compute the correlation functions of the monopole operators using the localization technique. It allows us to read up the uh, monopole actions on the vortex state, and also using this monopole action, we can easily extract the uh, Coulomb branch. Uh, Coulomb branch algebra involving the full quantum corrections. So our goal is to compute the Coulomb branch chiaverly exactly using the supersymmetry localization. Okay, let me first briefly introduce 3D and equal force theories. 3D and, and also vacuum structure. 3D and equal force theory will consider the gauge theory with the gauge group G with the number of hypermultiplets. And n equal force theory preserves the eight real supersymmetries with Q. And also the theory has the R symmetry SO4 or SU2H times SU2C. So this index A and A dot correspond to doublet indices for SU2 and SU2C. And also alpha correspond to Lorentz index. n equal force theory has two different supermultiplets. Firstly, we have the vector multiplet. Vector multiplet consists of uh, n equal two vector multiplet with the gauge field and the scalar field sigma in adjoint type of, uh, adjoint representation. And also it involves n equal two chiral multiplet in adjoint representation with the scalar field phi. There is another, uh, so n equal four vector multiplet has gauge field and three scalar field sigma and phi. There is another super multiplet called hyper multiplet and hypermultiplet consists of two n equal to chiral multiplets with the scalar field n, x, and y. And with this particular super potential, the full system has n equal four supersymmetry enhancement. And this n equal four gauge theory has very rich structure of the supersymmetric vector, which is parameterized by the vacuum expectation value of the gauge invariant operators. Roughly speaking, the, this moduli space is a product of two branches, one is called the Higgs branch, parameterized by the scalar field nx and y in the hypermultiplet, and the other one is called the Coulomb branch, parameterized by the scalar field in the vector multiplet with monopole operators. And they can intersect and not trivial as fixed points. And these two branches are both hypercalar space. They have a three uh, complex structure, and for example, this SU to H R symmetry acts on the Higgs branch. It rotates the uh, three complex structure as a triplet. And similarly, SU to C acts on this Coulomb branch. Let me discuss more about the uh, moduli space. Firstly, Higgs branch. Again, it's parameterized by the vacuum expectation value of the scalar field in the hypermultiplet. And on the generic point, uh, Coulomb branch, the other uh, scalar fields in the vector multiplet, they are set to zero. And this two scalar field is satisfy F term and D term constraints like this. And hyper, uh, sorry, 
Six branch moduli space admit the hyperkähler quotient construction. It's just simply given by this hyperkähler quotient. It's the space of x and y satisfying determine f time equation or the momentum air constraint modeled by gauge transformation. And it turns out that this uh, space given by hyperkähler quotient is receives no quantum correction. It means the classical geometry from this equation is exact. So the geometry on the Higgs branch is rather is eternalized. However, in this talk, I focus on the other branch. It's called Coulomb branch. And Coulomb branch is parameterized by vacuum expectation value of the three, three scalar field, sigma and phi, in the vector multiplet. And also, the monopole operator, they participate in the Coulomb branch. Because of this fact, we, to understand the geometry on the Coulomb branch, we have to understand, first understand the dynamics of the monopole operators. And monopole operators are usually defined as a singularity in the path integral. So in the path integral, we will consider some non-trivial uh, gauge, singular gauge field configuration around the point. So gauge field near the uh, insertion point of the monopole operator behaves like this. M is the magnetic charge. So if we integrate the uh, field strength of this gauge field around the, the monopole insertion point, then we get the non-zero magnetic flux. And M is the magnetic charge. They are in, uh, it takes values in the weight lattice of the dual gauge group G. So the vacuum expectation value of this operator gives another direction in the Coulomb branch. And combining this new direction, the Coulomb branch forms a hyperkähler space with a complex dimension two times rank of the gauge group. And unlike the Higgs branch, which was very robust uh, under the quantum effect, this Coulomb branch receives uh, uh, both perturbative correction and also non-perturbative instanton correction. So the classical geometry is severely modified by the quantum effect. So in general, it's very hard to study. But sometimes, we can study quantum corrected Coulomb branch using some duality in 3D gauge theory. For example, if we have some brain construction of the 3D gauge theory, there are many dualities between the theory. We can use the duality, for example, using mirror duality, and study some quantum correction on the Coulomb branch by studying its mirror dual theory on the Higgs branch. However, this, method, this approach is rather indirect. So it would be very nice if we can find some direct approach for the monopole operator and the Coulomb branch. So in this talk, I'll introduce one interesting direct approach, more direct approach to uh, study quantum dynamics of the monopole operators, and also it can read of the Coulomb branch geometry more directly. So we'll consider monopoles in the Higgs branch. In the Higgs branch, there are some solitonic particles for, uh, called vortices. They are particle-like object which carries an non-trivial magnetic flux on the outer plane where the mono, uh, vortex particle is located as a point. So the vortex particle has a mag thin magnetic flux along its world line. And monopole operator in Higgs branch has a magnetic flux, but actually this magnetic flux is confined in the Higgs branch. So it means that the monopole operator should be attached to the flux line generated by the vortex particles, like this picture. Okay, so they, here the green, uh, sorry, blue line is the flux by the monopole, uh, sorry, vortex particle, and this red dot is the monopole operator. And we know that monopole operator carries non-zero magnetic charge. So if the world line of this vortex uh, pass through this operator, its magnetic flux should change like this. So we expect that this monopole operator connect two vortex solutions with uh, magnetic charge N and the other vortex solution with magnetic charge N plus A, where this A is the magnetic charge for the monopole operator. So from the point of view on this uh, one-dimensional theory on vortex world line, this operator can be considered as some interface or kink or domain or which interpolate two different vortex solutions with magnetic charge N and M plus A. So monopole operators uh, 
interface in one dimensional vortex quantum mechanics. We can also combine several different monopole operators, of course. They become combinations of the interface in the one dimensional vortex quantum mechanics. So we'll try to find, we'll try to construct gauge theory description for this combined system of the vortices with the monopole interface. Basically, in this case, the uh, monopole is confined in the vortex. Yes, well done. Sorry? Is this, is this a generic situation? Yeah, on the hit branch. Yeah, they should oh, be okay. attached to the flux line. Okay. Yeah. And also, we will define this theory such that all this line is uh, localized at the origin on this plane. But uh, I'll talk about it later. So without monopole operator, we know the, how to describe the dynamics of this vortex flux line using the one-dimensional quantum mechanics. Hanani and Tung, they uh, proposed the brain construction for these vortex particles, and we can read up basically the gauge theory living on the vortices from the brains. So in this talk, I'll generalize their construction to involve non-trivial monopole interface into the one-dimensional quantum mechanics. So once we have the one-dimensional quantum mechanical system, we can try to compute the partition function of this system. So we'll consider this computation again with the vortex state here with the charge N and another vortex state here with the charge N plus A and the two vortex solutions are interpolated by this operator VA. And we'll compute the partition function of this system. Then it's clear this partition function will compute this correlation function of the monopole operator. And it turns out that this partition function or correlation function can be computed using supersymmetric localization. And once we compute this partition function, we can extract how the monopole operator is acting on the vortex states. So we can extract the monopole action from this exact computation of partition function. And our main goal is to extract the exact chiral ring relation or the clone branch algebra from this correlation function. I'll explain details about this one in my, uh, the second part of my talk. And I'll also discuss the quantization of the Coulomb branch algebra in our settings. So this is our line for my talk. Uh, I'll first discuss the classical geometry on the Coulomb branch and also explain the subtleties which arise from the quantum effect. And also I'll briefly discuss the Higgs branch again and also vortex moduli space. And in the second part, I will introduce vortex quantum mechanics constructed by Hanani and Tong, and I will explain how to incorporate the monopole operators or monopole interface into this vortex quantum mechanics. And then I will compute the correlation function and show that how to, uh, so that we can actually derive the Coulomb branch algebra from this computation. Questions so far? Okay, before discuss Coulomb branch and monopole operators, so let me first explain the symmetry of the 3D and equal 4 gauge theory and also possible deformations. We will mainly focus on the unitary gauge group. So, all the, so we will consider unitary quiver gauge theory, but each node has unitary type gauge groups and also fundamental hypermultiplet and two gauge nodes are connected by five fundamentals. And, but mostly I'll focus on just a single gauge node with the uh, UN gauge group. Apart from this gauge group and also R symmetry, symmetry, we have the global symmetry. Firstly, the flavor symmetry, which acts on the uh, hypermultiplet. So in our case, flavor symmetry acting on the hypermultiplet, of course it acts only on the Higgs branch, is the product of SUNF groups. And there are also topological symmetry. For each U1 factors in the gauge group, we have the topological U1 symmetry. It acts on the Coulomb branch. And also, this U1 topological symmetry has a charge. The charge is nothing but the gauge charge, oh sorry, magnetic charge of the gauge group. So the magnetic objects such as monopole operator and vortices, they carry non-trivial U1 topological charge. And this U1 topological symmetry will open in it will be open in answer to the non-abelian symmetry in the IR fixed point, but that is not uh, today's topic. 
So we will consider possible deformations of this theory. Firstly, we can con for the flavor symmetry, we can consider the mass deformation. We can turn on the mass parameter for the flavor symmetry. So mass parameter we can turn on uh, basically three. We can turn on the real mass parameter and complex mass parameter. They are basically background scalar field in the vector multiplex for the flavor symmetry group. So simply, we can introduce these parameters by shifting the uh, scalar field into vector multiplex sigma by the real mass parameter and complex scalar field by by its complex mass parameter with appropriate uh, flavor charges. And for the topological U1 symmetry, we can introduce the FI parameters. We can again turn on the three FI parameters. We have the real FI parameter and complex FI parameter. They appear in the momentum map constraints. So it's like shift of the momentum map by constant value TR and TC. We can also turn on, we can further turn on another deformation of the theory. We can turn on the omega deformation introduced by, introduced by uh, Negrasso for the U1, U1 angular rotation along the two plane. So this omega deformation can be easily introduced by shifting the complex scalar field in the vector multiplet by the redirective along the rotations and with the parameter epsilon. Epsilon is the omega deformation parameter. And in order to preserve the supersymmetry, we have a twist to this U1 Lorentz rotation with the U1 patterns of the Higgs branch rotation. So the omega deformation is introduced by this combination of com shift of this combination for this scalar field in the vector multiply. In our setting, we will turn on the complex mass parameter and real mass parameter. So we will basically break the n equal 4 symmetry to n equal 2. So now we can talk about the chiral operators. And later when I discuss the Coulomb branch geometry, I'll just focus on the uh, chiral ring sectors of the Coulomb branch. So let's discuss about the clone branch. Okay, first example is the simplest one, Abelian theory. For Abelian theory, we know the exact geometry of the clone branch. It's basically we can construct the monopole operator using the uh, elementary local field. And also the U1 Abelian gauge field can be dualized to a, a field, local field. It's periodic scalar field A which we call as a dual photons. So the abelian gauge field can be dualized into a scalar field with these uh, relations. So this scalar field, oh sorry, this scalar field is periodic and periodicity is given by the gauge coupling. Using this scalar field and the scalar field in the vector multiple, we can construct the monopole operator in this way. This is the monopole operator with its chart, uh, your topological charge plus or minus one. This operator carries your topological charge ba because basically the charge of the your topological symmetry is given by the flux, integration of the flux. So it is encoded in this periodic scalar as a shift symmetry. So if you look at this operator, this operator will carry the U1, uh, charge one or minus one for the your topological charge. And it is known that the it is known that this operator belongs to the n equal to chiral multiplane. And involving this monopole operator, actually the classical Coulomb branch is simply given by this relation. It's parameterized by the scalar field in the vector multiplane. We have the, for U1 theory, we have one back, uh, complex scalar field phi. And also we have the monopole operators. They parameterize the Coulomb branch with this relation. Classically, V plus one, uh, V plus and V minus, they, are, they have inverse uh, relation. So this classical Coulomb branch is basically R3 times S1, parameterized by the phi, sigma, and periodic scalar A. But this classical Coulomb branch is modified by the one correction. And if we carefully compute the one correction, for example, for NF fundamental hypermultiplet, the exact Coulomb branch is given by the scalar field in the vector multiplet and monopole operators with these relations. And this geometry is a famous uh, geometry called the AN singularity. For NF flavors, we have AMF minus one singularity, but this geometry is deformed by the complex mass parameters. 
and indeed, this space is hyperscalar, as we expected from the spatiometry. So abelian theory, we know how to compute the Coulomb branch geometry exactly. Okay. Later, I will rederive this relation using our approach. It, that would be the simplest example which you can apply our methods and extract the quantum correction on the Coulomb branch. However, for nonabelian theory, it's more complicated. Nonabelian Coulomb branch is still parameterized by the scalar field in the vector multiplet and also monopole operators. Yeah. However, we don't know how to dualize the uh, non-abelian gauge field like the previous example. Here we knew the, how to dualize this gauge field and how to write down the monopole operators using elementary field. But for non-abelian theory, we don't know. However, on the generic point on the clone branch where the scalar field phi takes non-zero vacuum expectation value, the non-abelian theory will be broken to the, its abelian subgroup. So in the infrared, if we integrate out all the massive W bosons and charged matters, then infrared, infrared geometry simply becomes abelian theory. Infrared theory simply becomes abelian theory. So in the infrared, we can realize the infrared gauge field and construct the monopole operator using its dual photon field A, like this. So with the uh, magnetic charge M, the monopole operator in the infrared can be written in this way. So in the infrared, the classical Coulomb branch geometry is simply given by product of R3 times S1 divided by uh, phi volumes. This description is reliable far along the Coulomb branch when the scalar field phi takes non-zero vacuum expectation value. However, it breaks down around the origin of the Coulomb branch because of the quantum effect by the massless W bosons and also the non-abelian gauge symmetry is in a restored. So at the origin of the Coulomb branch, in general, it's very hard to study this geometry. So our motivation is to compute the Coulomb branch chiral ring, which involves the full quantum correction on the generic point on the Coulomb branch. And in order to compute this chiral ring relation, we'll study monopole actions on the vortices in the Higgs branch. So it motivates us to study the Higgs branch and vortices more carefully. We'll focus on the UN gauge theory with NF fundamental hypermultiplet, and we'll turn on the real F5 parameter. Okay. Then the theory reduced to the Higgs branch. And Higgs branch is of this theory with the positive FI parameter is a no, uh, it's a hypercalous space. It's known as uh, Tista, Grassmannian, and NF. However, we are uh, interested in the submanifold of the Higgs branch where we ha have the non trivial vortex solution. Okay? This submanifold is called Grassmannian, G and NF, parameterized by only one single complex scalar field X. And all other scalar fields on this space should vanish. And each point on this Grassmannian manifold, we have the VPS vortices. We'll, we'll label each point by the letter U, and we can find the VPS vortex solution, which is satisfied by the following vortex equations. The first two lines are famous vortex uh, equations, and the vortex carries non zero flux uh, on the alt plane. On alt plane is here. And flux, this is again localized uh, almost around the origin, and it decays exponentially if we go away from the origin. So we can approximate this solution as a particle solution. And also, this solution reduced to the, each vacuum as spatial infinity. We'll consider this BPS uh, vortex solutions. We have a family of these solutions, and they form a moduli space. It's called the vortex moduli space. I label them as a mu, uh, M and U for each vacuum. And each complex manifold uh, with a complex dimension N, N is the vortex charge times the number of flavors. And this uh, uh, vortex moduli space has isometry U1 times SUN times SUNF minus N. This U1 G corresponds to the Lorentz rotation around these two planes. And the other isometry group is the symmetry on the Higgs branch. 
So we want to study the modulized space of vortices, but it's very complicated manifold. So in general, it's very hard to compute, uh, hard to study. So to make the problem simpler, we'll turn on the complex mass and also omega deformation parameters. And as I explained, it can, they can be realized by shifting phi with their parameters like this. Then it lifted the Higgs branch and leaves uh, only a finite number of isolated massive vector. For our case, the number of the massive vector is given by this number. And each massive vector corresponds to the fixed point with respect to the equivalent gauge and flavor rotations. And for each vacuum, we can find the uh, vortex solutions. And to lift the vortex moduli space, we'll also turn on this omega deformation. Then with this omega deformation, vortex moduli space will be again localized to the uh, isolated fixed point uh, under this flavor and gauge and also omega deformation rotations. So each fixed point or each uh, fixed vortex stage can be labeled by uh, vortex charge N and also the abelianized magnetic charge K. It's consists of the N in positive, integer, positive or zero integer numbers. And there are some corresponding to the total vortex charge. So on the omega deformation, we have the discrete vortex solutions with also mass deformation. And omega deformation has a very interesting consequence. Uh, if you turn on the omega deformation parameter, it provides additional uh, potential proportional to the angular momentum. So all the particles, they, uh, uh, they are attracted to the origin. So effectively, omega deformation compactify our three-dimensional theory to one-dimensional quantum mechanics at the origin. Origin is the uh, fixed point under this, um, uh, what is it? U1 Z rotation or ultra rotations. So instead of studying complicated 3D gauge theory, we can just focus on the one-dimensional quantum mechanics with the vortex states. Then you can ask what is the Hilbert space in this 1D quantum mechanics. And this, the Hilbert space of this 1D quantum mechanics is simply given by equivalent cohomology of the moduli space of the half EPS vortex states. So Hilbert space is defined on each vacuum. So we we'll label Hilbert space with uh, the vacuum label U, and it's given by fixed point of the equivalent rotations. But for our case, the fixed point is nothing but the vortex stage labeled by integer number N and collection of integer numbers K. So our Hilbert space of this one-dimensional quantum mechanics is the collection of the vortex stage. And monopole operator acts on this vortex stage, so it means it acts on our Hilbert space. Yes. Sorry, but you you change the pitch pitch end out of N to C, for example. Yeah, that's it's right. Just a change of the rotation. Yeah, rotation it, the for simple case, it's just by rotation. Oh, by exchange, I by permutation. Uh, for example, if you consider more generic Hilbert gauge theory, vacuum structure is more complicated. It's not simply the by exchange, uh, by permutation of the some symmetry group. In that case, Hilbert space becomes much more complicated. But in this talk, I'll discuss some simple cases. Okay. Yeah. So let's discuss about the vortex quantum mechanics and the monopole operators. So vortex quantum mechanics has a nice gauge theory description with a monopole operator first. It was obtained by Hanani and Kong using the brains. So they first considered this brain system. It gives a low energy the three-dimensional UN gauge theory with NF fundamental hypermultiplets. UN gauge theory is living on this N D3 brains, and hypermultiplets are provided by this semi-infinite NF D3 brains. We want to study the Higgs branch, so we should turn on the FI parameter now. FI parameter in this branch is uh, corresponded to the relative distance between NS5 and NS5 prime along 7, 8, 9 directions. But here, I will turn on just one real FI parameter. So if you turn on the FI parameter, this configuration will become this. So now the gauge symmetry that rotates ND3 brain is completely broken. And also the flavor symmetry that rotates NFD3 brain is again broken to the SUN, which rotates the N semi-infinite D3 brain. And NF, we have the SUNF minus N flavor symmetry, which rotates this set of brain. 
these three brains. So this brain configuration agrees with the dynamics and the experience of the straight gauge shoot. Then what is the vortices, vortex particles? It was provided by the B1 brains, stretched between NS5 prime and N D3 brains. It provides uh, magnetic char particles to the 3D gauge series. So if we want to have the charge N vortex solution, we can introduce N D1 brains. Then Hanani Tong's claim is that the dynamics of this N D1 brain describe the vortex uh, dynamics of the vortices with the charge N. And since we have the brains, we can read of the uh, gauge theory living on the d brains, which describe the dynamics of the mono, uh, vortex particles in the gauge theory. And we have a simple, uh, this picture can be simply generalized to more complicated uh, quiver gauge theory. For example, if we consider a uh, triangular quiver theory, they consist of uh, uh, several NS5 brains and number of D3 brains between NS5 brains. And from uh, this uh, what is it, brain construction, and we can go to the Higgs branch, and again, we can introduce several Dion brains and try to read up the one-dimensional quantum mechanics which describe the vortex dynamics from the brains. So we can easily generalize this construction to more complicated cases. And for this simple case, the dynamics of vortexes is described by one-dimensional n equal two comma two gauge quantum mechanics with this quiver diagram. So here we have u n u small n gauge group with three chiral multiplets. First one is b, it's uh, adjoint chiral multiplet, and we have fundamental chiral multiplet q and anti-fundamental chiral multiplet q tilde. They are also charged under the s u n and s u n f minus n flavor symmetry. So the symmetry of this quiver gauge theory agrees with the isometry of the vortex moduli space. And Hanan and Tom conjecture that the Higgs branch of this one-dimensional quiver gauge theory agrees with the moduli space of the vortices as a complex manifold. So it means we can study uh, the, some topological sector of the vortex moduli space using this one-dimensional quantum mechanical uh, observables. So we will focus on this one, the quantum mechanics. Then what is the vortex uh, monopole operator in this quantum mechanics? So we'll consider this 3D configuration. Now we turn on the omega deformation. So all the dynamics is localized at the origin. We have vortex solution here and another vortex solution here. It's interpolated by the monopole operator here. So in this 1D quantum mechanics, remember that the vortex charge is mapped to the rank of the gauge group. So in this 1D quantum mechanics, we can consider some monopole operator as an interface interpolating the U1 vortex, uh, UN vortex quantum mechanics to UN plus A vortex quantum mechanics. So it turns out that we have natural half APS interface in this quantum mechanics. And half APS more precisely preserves n equals zero, uh, zero to spot symmetry. And this spot symmetry agrees. Sorry? Oh, uh, I mean, uh, this quantum mechanics can be obtained from the 2D, uh, 2D field theory by dimensional reduction. Yeah, it's yeah. Just yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So, so, what the dimension you have no distinction between the two chirality. Yeah, yeah, in, in one dimensional there is no distinction. But this, this is just analog, analogy for the 2D field theory. Yeah, but we have two different n equal to. We can have one comma one or zero two. They have two different series. Yeah. So that's why I use this notation because I want to emphasize that it preserves different supersymmetry. So this supersymmetry agrees with the supersymmetry preserved by monopole, uh, bulk monopole operator and the uh, vortex stage. Remember the vortex stage preserves the two comma two supersymmetry. And the monopole operator preserve the zero four. So their intersection preserve only zero two supersymmetry. So it agrees with this uh, zero two supersymmetry of this interface system. So let me tell you the details. We'll consider a monopole interface which connects n vortices to n prime vortices. OK, 
Okay, let's first discuss the boundary condition. So, the construction can be given by this one, two, three steps. Firstly, we need to specify the boundary condition for the bulk field. So, in this case, we will choose the Neumann boundary condition for the both one-d vector and chiral multiplex. And it turns out that if we choose a Neumann boundary condition, it induces n equal zero to zero dimension. Again, it's just analogy because in zero D there is no chirality. So it's a zero dimensional vector and chiral multiplex at the interface. Okay. So we have two systems meeting at the interface. So we have a two such vector and chiral multiplex, zero dimensional vector and chiral multiplex at the interface. And we'll combine these two multiplex to some extra zero dimensional degrees of freedom. We'll add additional zero dimensional degrees of freedom psi which is the chiral multiplex, and gamma, eta, eta tilde. So we will introduce three fairing multiplex. And this chiral multiplex is by fundamental on the un times the un prime. And also fairing multiplex gamma is a by fundamental, and eta is anti-fundamental, eta tilde is fundamental. We we'll couple this zero dimensional extra degrees of freedom to the bulk boundary condition through the following superpotentials. In zero D, we have the three very multiplex, so we can introduce different types of superpotentials. In zero two notation, we have J type and E type superpotentials, but we will turn off the all E type superpotential and turn on only J type superpotential in this way. And we claim that this simple construction gives the interface corresponding to the monopole operator, which interpolates two different vortex solutions. Then how do you know it? If we look at the ground state of this system with the interface, then actually this, ground, uh, this interface provides a natural map from the moduli space of M prime vortices to the moduli space of M vortices. So there is isomorphism between these two moduli space. If we divide this bigger moduli space by the kernel of this bifundamental scalar field side. And it is known in mathematics as a Hecke correspondence. So in mathematics, this map is called the Hecke correspondence, appearing in the geometric Langland program for the monopole operator acting on the gauge bundles in the X range. So our interface has the exactly what we want to have the monopole actions in the vortex quantum mechanism. So we claim this interface will realize the monopole operator properly. And now I will give you another evidence that this interface is correct. So now we have the theory. We can try to compute the partition function. We will consider the following configuration. So we put the one-dimensional vortex system on the interval between T1 and T2. And we give the boundary condition such that system reduced to the, oh, sorry. For simplicity, I'll focus on just the U1 gauge theory in three dimensions. So at T1, the system we give the boundary condition such that the T1, uh, sorry, the system reduces to the vortex state labeled by N. And at T2, the system reduces to the another vortex state with a different charge N prime. And we'll interpolate these two vortex states by the interface which I explained in the previous slide. Then obviously this partition function will compute some correlation function for this operator with the vortex state. N and N prime. And the type of this operator is determined by the vortex state. For example, if we consider N prime equals N case, then obviously this interface just connects the same vortex state. So you expect that this interface becomes one. And it turns out that this interface actually becomes just simple gauge transformation around this insertion point. And also if we consider N prime equals N plus one, we now have the two vortex solutions with the different charges. So this operator will become the monopole operator with charge plus one in this case. And it turns out that this correlation function or the partition function of this step can be easily computed using the localization. And this is the result for the simplest U1 3D gauge theory case. Here, omega n is the equivalent weight for the fixed point, or the inverse of the equivalent volume contribution to the vortex partition function. But, yeah. So for the identity operator, if we plug n prime 
as n in this formula, we get the correlation function of this identity operator. It simply becomes one of the equivalent uh, weight at the fixed point. We expect that this correlation function will compute, because O is now identity operator, will compute the uh, norm of the vortex states. Indeed, one over omega n, omega n is the equivalent uh, uh, weight at the fixed point, is exactly the correct normalization for the vortex states. And for example, if you compute the 3D vortex partition function or three-dimensional partition function uh, lying on the interval, and if you give the Neumann boundary condition for both ends, then the theory effectively becomes a two-dimensional theory, and we can compute the vortex partition function. And if we compute this vortex partition function, it's simply the norm of the Neumann boundary condition, then you get this result. And because it's a variable of the Neumann boundary condition, we can expect that this partition function should be sum of the norm of all the fixed points. So by looking at this relation, you can see this our correlation function correctly computes the uh, contribution of the fixed point to the vortex partition function, which is basically the inverse of the equivalent weight. And we can also compute the correlation function of the monopole operator with the charge plus one, minus one, by setting n prime equals n plus one. Then our correlation function will compute these correlation functions both for v plus and v minus with the charge plus and one and minus one. And actually we'll compute just these two uh, correlation function for these two elementary monopole operators because for U1 and actually for unitary gauge group, the elementary vortex action is enough to build other complicated vortex uh, actions with different uh, magnetic charges. Okay, so this correlation function is enough to capture the, all the monopole actions on the vortex state and we can actually construct the flung branch algebra using only this correlation function. So let's compute the monopole action and also flung uh, branch algebra from the correlation function computation. We know that we expect that vortex, uh, monopole operator V will bring one vortex state to the other vortex state with a charge plus one. And also we expect that monopole operator with a charge minus one brings vortex state to the another vortex state with a charge minus one. So we expect that this relation holds up to some unknown coefficient C plus and C minus. And we can easily compute this uh, unknown coefficient from our correlation functions. If you uh, sandwich the final states from this relation here and here, then you can easily compute. C plus becomes a simple ratio of the correlation function. And similarly, C minus is again given by ratio of the correlation function. So we can explicitly compute the monopole action using our correlation function. This is the exact result because we computed it using the localization. And furthermore, the 3D scalar field in the vector multiplet, it takes a non-zero vacuum expectation value when you act it on the vortex stage. So in the 3D theory, so we have this coupling, phi and for example, x. x is the uh, chiral multiplex, uh, sorry, hypermultiplex scalar field, and phi is the complex scalar field in the vector multiplex. After deformation, it's deformed in this way. Uh, plus m i plus epsilon delta c g one half. So vacuum, vacuum solution should solve this equation. And with the vortex charge m, X is a degree n polynomial. So you can see phi solves this equation if phi takes this. So bulk scalar field takes this expectation value when you act it on the vortex stage. So by combining these uh, actions of the Coulomb branch generators, the mo uh, it can be summarized in this way. So the monopole operator V acts on the vortex state with this coefficient. And this coefficient is simply the polynomial, uh, degree NF polynomial of X graded by the mass parameter M. And V minus acts on the vortex state 
but it brings just to the vortex state with the charge minus one. So this is the exact monopole action we computed using correlation function. And from this action, it's very easy to compute the Coulomb brain charge. Right? But firstly, I'll uh, add one more comment. As you see, the Hilbert space, they are just collections of the vortex state. It is generated by acting monopole operators repeatedly. So all the state in the Hilbert space can be generated from the vacuum state by acting the monopole operator with charge one. So it means that our Hilbert space is the highest way for my model of the Coulomb branch algebra. Then what is the Coulomb branch algebra? It's easy. And from the monopole action, you can easily derive this Coulomb branch algebra. And now the operators don't commute to each other. For example, V plus, V minus is not the same as V minus and V plus. So our Coulomb branch algebra is quantized with the uh, Planck constant proportional to epsilon. So our epsilon parameter, which corresponds to the omega deformation parameter, quantizes our Coulomb branch algebra. And it has name, it's a spherical version of the algebra. So this is done for rank one, and uh, capital N is the rank one? Yes, it's for rank one. Uh, yeah. I'll give you the, any rank in the next slide. Uh, <laughs> I have more complicated solutions, but uh, in this talk, I'll just discuss uh, the three gauge theory with one gauge node, but rank n. Yeah. This case is rank one. Yeah. So we computed the complicated Coulomb branch algebra using the correlation functions and the vortex quantum mechanics with the interface. And if you send the epsilon to zero limit, then this relation is nothing but the uh, what is the Coulomb branch geometry we computed using the one computation. So it reproduced our expected uh, Coulomb branch geometry. And the reason why we get the uh, non-commutative algebra is very simple. If you introduce, so before we introduce omega deformation parameters, the Coulomb branch operator, they can move around freely. So they can exchange their position arbitrarily, so freely. So they, their algebra becomes commutative. But if you turn on the omega deformation, then because of the extra potential of this omega deformation, all the operators should be aligned along the flux line or the origin. So if you want to exchange the, their positions, then they should hit each other. There is no way because they are aligned on the flux line. They should hit each other and they encounter the singularity. It means that their algebra becomes non-commutativity, non-commutative. And also our correlation function captures this non-commutativity of the Coulomb branch algebra. So, your original question is wanted to understand the Coulomb branch, Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. you're not directly computing, but you go to the fixed branch. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah, in the... Is there a guarantee that the algebra, that you can compute some fixed branch and algebra directly... Yeah, because... Coulomb, basically, Coulomb branch operator, they are defined in UV. Right. So uh, they don't care about the uh, uh, vacuum structure. So <laughs> this structure should hold for the other vacuum and any other vacuum. Oh, I see. Yeah. Except that the uh, uh, Coulomb branch operator has a coupling constant. That's right. But uh, we just derived the Coulomb branch chiral ring. So chiral ring doesn't depend on the gauge oh, coupling. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's why we could compute it. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, so this, this approach is worth for color, but if you try to compute other things... No, no, no. Yeah, as I explained, yeah, this one can capture only holomorphic part of this Coulomb branch geometry. Not the details so far. So lastly, let me give you the more general example. We will now consider UN gauge theory in bulk 3D gauge theory. So, now we have the vortex state labeled by the vortex charge N and also abelianized magnetic charge K with N set. Then the monopole operator we have again, the elementary monopole operator we have is again N monopole operators. And they act on this vortex state and it increases the eighth element of this K set by one with up to this coefficient. And similarly, monopole operator with charge minus one at ice, uh, how can I, node, uh, that node, ice element, 
will decrease the iso element of the k integers, uh, n integers, up to this coefficient. And again, the vector multiplex color field takes non-zero vacuum expectation value at the fixed point. And this algebra was computed again using the correlation function of, or the partition function of the 1D system with the interface. So we can compute the exact uh, monopole operator action on the state using our correlation function. And from these actions, you can easily derive the Coulomb branch algebra. Again, it's quantized. V plus and V minus, they don't come in by the epsilon parameter. And if you take the epsilon to zero limit, then this algebra actually reproduced the conjectured algebra by these people, Blimo, Dimokte, and Gario. So for the general case, we can again compute the Coulomb branch algebra using our quantum mechanics with the interface and each partition function. Uh, let me conclude. So we try to compute the exact Coulomb branch algebra using correlation function computation. To do that, we constructed the monopole operators in the one-dimensional quantum mechanics and computed each correlation function. And it allows us to compute the exact Coulomb branch chiral ring. And our work can be easily generalized to more general cases. In our paper, we also computed the Coulomb branch algebra and monopole actions for the triangular cubic gauge theory, which appears as uh, the theory living on the defect of the 4D gauge theory, uh, uh, surface defect. And if you compute the Coulomb branch algebra, it turns out that it's simply, the, it's not simply, it's nothing but the finite WN algebra. And this computation also explains the finite AGT correspondence appearing in the body gauge theory with the surface defect. And also, as I explained at the beginning, we computed the same clone branch algebra using completely different approach called the modular matrix approach. It's like this approach is basically solving the vortex solution using the holomping matrix called the modular matrix. And the monopole operator acts on this mod modular matrix as a holomorphic singular gauge transformation. And we can compute the, each action using similar localization. But these two approaches are completely different. And their results, of course, agree each other. So in our paper, we proposed the two different approaches for the monopole operators and the clone branch, uh, clone branch chiral rings. And you can also consider the following generalization. You can consider general unitary cubic gauge theory. It was, so the Coulomb branch algebra of general unitary cubic gauge theory was proposed by these people. Uh, actually, our computation just confirms some part of this uh, general unitary cubic gauge theory. For example, for triangular and also linear abelian cubic theory. But we have more complicated theory. So, but complicated theory, they have very complicated vacuum structure. So in general, it's not we don't have the general prescription how to construct the uh, vortex quantum mechanics and also the interface yet. But it would be very nice if we can give some general prescription for it. And we can also consider high dimensional generalization. For example, in 4D, this operator will become the tooth operator, and in 5D, it will become the monopole string operator. So we can try to uh, apply our method to compute the, their, uh, this non trivial. Uh, defect operators in high dimension and their non trivial algebras between these operators. And we can also try to consider the generalization to the theory with less supersymmetry, for example, n equals 3 and n equals 2 theories. But at this moment, I don't know how to do it. And also, extension to other gauges uh, groups would be interesting. But problem is for other gauge groups, for example, SO and SP gauge group, we don't have FI parameter and we don't have vortices. So uh, our method actually uses the Higgs branch and the vortex stage and the monopole actions on the vortex stage. So this method cannot be applied, but probably this modular matrix approach can be applied to get the exact chiral rings for the other gauge groups. Let me stop here.